My title this morning is Christ's Abundant Sufficiency for Us. Christ's Abundant Sufficiency for Us. This morning we're beginning to look at chapter 6 of John's Gospel, and it culminates really in the second half of the chapter. It all leading towards that great bread of life discourse that Jesus gives in the second half of the chapter. So verse 35, let me give a little taste of that. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so it goes on in that whole section. This chapter is rich in Jesus teaching us about himself, and not just about himself, but about his great sufficiency for those who trust in him, for those who believe in him. And so we have these things in embryonic form at the start of our chapter as well in the section that we're looking at. So my title then is Christ's Abundant Sufficiency for Us, both eternally and also in the things of this life as well. Our everyday matters. Christ's Abundant Sufficiency for Us. So first of all, we're going to look at Christ's overflowing generosity as we look at the feeding of the 5,000. And secondly, we're going to look at his awesome going forth to save as we see him rescuing his distressed disciples on the Sea of Galilee. So then, first of all, Christ's overflowing generosity. The chapter begins with the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, we should note, as it's always worth observing, that this is, verse 10, 5,000 men. And that means 5,000 families. There were women and children besides the men. We know that from Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. Just the men are being counted in the 5,000 here. So 5,000 families we're thinking about here. So we're thinking about something like a, a, sta- a football stadium-sized crowd of people, something like that. A huge, great crowd, a massive crowd, and the thing is that they're hungry. And so Jesus asks a question in verse 5. Jesus said to Philip, Where? Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii, that's 200 days uh, days wages, roughly. Um, Denarius is a day's day's wages. 200 um, denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Now, with food prices so high at the moment, I think we can probably relate to this quite well. Um, If you're a if you're the, the shopper in your family and you go to the supermarket, then you'll have been seeing the prices creep up, haven't you? And it's getting more difficult uh, to, to sort of keep things in budget. Uh, feeding a, a family is, is, is uh, expensive. Feeding a crowd is, is very expensive. And feeding this crowd would have been impossibly expensive. But Jesus asks here where, or literally he says, from where? From where? From where are we going to get enough to, to, uh, to feed this crowd? And he asks this knowing and and probing and drawing his disciples into seeing from whom the need could and would be met. Philip, who, who Jesus asks, Philip can't even begin to think from where their need would be met. All Philip can see is the vastness of the need, verse 7. He just, he just says, well, eight months' wages, 200 denarii is, isn't going to be enough for even a little bit for everyone, let alone filling them up and satisfying their tummies. So Philip just sees the need. He can't even begin to think from where that need would be met. Now, I'm not keen when preachers are hard on Bible characters. I don't know if you've heard this. You know, preachers, you know, go, well, we wouldn't have done that, would we? You know, uh, well, maybe I've done it probably a lot of times myself. But, but my point is here, here is that Jesus has just been healing many sick people, verse 2. It's even clearer in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 14, verse 14. Jesus has been just been healing many people in this very crowd. He spent all day doing that. He's been teaching as well. He's also been healing a lot of people in that crowd, miracle after miracle. So shouldn't they have seen the answer to Jesus' question, or at least have picked up on Jesus' hint to Philip? From where? Philip? Where's it going to be? Just look around, think from where things have happened today. From where is this need going to be met? Now I mention that not, to feel, not for us to feel superior, but so that we recognize ourselves in Philip. Don't we do exactly the same? We, we see answers to our prayers. We, we see the Lord blessing us. We see the Lord doing good things in our daily lives. 
answering prayers, all sorts of things. And then something big comes, and we just see that big thing, that big issue, that big problem, that big difficulty, whatever it is. And we can't even begin to think, like Philip, we can't even begin to think from where we're going to get help for this difficulty, whatever it might be. We completely miss the answer, just like Philip did. So this morning, I think, I hope, I pray, is about helping you and me to see the answer, to see from where we're going to get the help that we need just to live our daily lives. And when we see the answer, to remember that answer at the vital moments when we can just see nothing but the problem. But this is big, we we think to ourselves. I can't see any solution to this. I can't see any help. That's exactly what Philip's thinking here. So in other words then, as we see Philip's slowness in verse 9, it's a mirror. It's showing you, you, and it's showing me, me. It's showing us ourselves. And so as we see the answer to their issue in this passage, that same answer applies to us here too, who love Jesus as Lord and Saviour. What's the answer to this need that they have? What's the answer to our needs? Or to ask the question in in terms of Psalm 121, from where does our help come? Our help comes from the Lord. And in this passage, it comes from Jesus. The Lord is Jesus, who's the answer to our needs. That's the big point of this morning. Jesus in this passage does more than they could ask or imagine. Philip can't imagine a way even for everyone to get a little bit, verse 7. Sorry, verse verse 7, is it? Yes, verse 7. I said verse 9 a minute ago, I meant verse 7. So Philip can't even imagine a a way uh, for everyone to get even a tiny bit, just a little taster. But actually Jesus supplies such an abundance of food. Think of those pictures earlier. An overflowing abundance of food that everyone eats their fill. So let me read from verse 8 to 12. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, said to Jesus, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing may be lost. Okay, so everyone's eating their fill here. End of verse 11. Everyone's having as much as they wanted. And this is a football stadium-sized crowd eating their fill. There's a word that occurs in verses 12 and 13 that in my humble opinion, is translated rather rather weakly in the ESV and in quite a few other translations as well. The ESV translates the word in verse uh, verse, um, 12, leftovers, leftover. And it's translated in verse 13 as left. Uh, The five barley loaves left, uh, sorry. So they gathered them up, verse, verse 13, and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who'd eaten. The King James does a better job in verse 13. It it says, what remained over and above. These leftovers then, the point about these leftovers is that they're an overabundance above and beyond what is needed. The Greek word for it is not about leftovers. It's about abundant provision. More than enough being provided. The same word is used in chapter 10, verse 10. I came that they, my sheep, says Jesus, may have life and have it like leftovers. No, abundantly. That's what Jesus came for, to give us abundant life, both in terms of quantity, eternal life, and in terms of quality, eternal life with him. The same word, the same Greek word is used to describe the huge growth of the church In Acts chapter 16, verse 5, abundant growth. The same word is used three times in Romans chapter, second half of Romans chapter 5, 
to describe the abundance of God's grace and the free gift of righteousness that are given through Christ. And it says at the end of the chapter, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And literally the word is there, grace hyperabounded. I reckon Paul makes a new word up there. It's, it's our, our word with hyper on the front. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8 says this, uh, and it's just, well, it, um, it talks about the riches of God's grace being lavished on us. Lavished, that's our word here that's used to describe the leftovers. They're not leftovers, it's an overabundance. Lavish, more than plenty provision. So the point back in John 6 is, Jesus is not meagre in what he's able and willing to supply. Think of Boaz earlier, how Boaz lavishly supplied Ruth with her needs, kept giving her more and more, and her mother-in-law's got her eyes popping out of her head as she sees what Ruth brings home from Boaz. So Christ supplies his beloved too, his church, with her needs. Jesus uses Boaz-like language in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. He talks about a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. I think he's maybe thinking of Boaz. It's possible. How different this is from the world. Are crisp packets getting emptier, do you think? Hmm, I get some nods around the place. Yeah, I think they might be. The world sneaks things away from us. The world puts smaller and smaller things in bigger and bigger boxes or boxes with false bottoms to them. So you think they're full and you get to the bottom and you think, is that the bottom? I've only just re- reached an inch, inch or two down. I, I can't think of an example when I, I saw that recently, but it was a bit of a surprise, a bit of a shock. Or, or think about um, uh, the housing market. Um, the world does tricks to make properties for sale seem bigger than they are, doesn't they? All sorts of tricks, camera tricks. I think they used to use undersized furniture in show homes. I don't know if they still do that. Yeah, there we go. Mm. That's what the world does. Makes things smaller and smaller, but look bigger and bigger. But Jesus presses down, shakes together, and pours more on. He's totally different from the world. Totally different from the world. My cup overflows, says David in Psalm 23, verse 5, as he thinks of the Lord's goodness. We've sung it this morning, haven't we? My cup overflows. O Lord, blessed are those who dwell in your house, says Psalm 84. They go from strength to strength. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Do you remember the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon to see if his splendor was as great as she had heard in her own country? What took her breath away was not just Solomon's splendor, which foreshadows Christ's, but also what took her breath away was the rich way in which his servants were arrayed and supplied which foreshadows us who trust in Christ. Let me read a few verses from 1 Kings 10. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he'd he'd built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard. The half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report I heard. Listen, happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you. So this is what I want you to take away, those who love Christ this morning. The people of Christ lack no good thing. You have in Christ, if you have Christ as your saviour, you lack no good thing, whatever your need. He knows your needs. And Jesus is not so meagre in supplying the uh, the needs of his bride. What husband uh, sees his wife beside him and sees her need and and just gives her barely enough? If that's like, like on a human level, then how much more for Jesus with his bride, his church? And in fact, in the feeding of the 5,000, his miraculous and abundant provision of food is for those beyond his saved people. We know that from verse 28 and 29. The crowd are largely non-believers. 
and yet he supplies their need. He supplies this magnificent meal for them. Now I want to pursue this point further, so we'll do that looking at the second incident that we're looking at. So secondly then, Christ's awesome going forth to save. Let me read verses 16 to 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, got into a boat and started across the lake to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The lake became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the lake and coming near the boat and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Did you know the Bible does not speak of Jesus walking on the water? Did you know that? Rather, it speaks of him walking on the sea, which is far more difficult. The sea surges and crashes. It is utterly chaotic. We're talking about the middle of the sea, not the sort of nice serene sea that we might see from the, 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 uh, the seafront in Eastbourne. We're talking about the the, the stormy sea, a fully developed sea, uh, meteorologists will talk about. In other words, huge great waves. It's a place of death. Walking on a mill pond is child's play in comparison with walking on the sea when it's like that. And it's a surging sea that Jesus walked on here, verse 18. Only Yahweh tramples the waves of the sea. Job chapter 9, verse 8. The Lord alone does that. The Lord alone tramples the waves of the sea. And if we wanted proof of Jesus' deity in John chapter 6, there's plenty in verse 19, as Jesus does exactly that. But the point is, Jesus here tramples the waves, as only God can, specifically to help and rescue his fearful disciples in great danger. He, He goes to meet their need. He tramples the waves of the sea to meet his disciples' need. Now, I think there are two Old Testament passages in the background to this incident which highlight the beauty and the wonderfulness, if that's a word, I'll make it up, the wonderfulness of what Jesus does here. The first is Psalm 107. Maybe you'd like to turn there. Psalm 107, verse, uh, it's on page 506. It's a psalm about the steadfast love of the Lord, as it says at the beginning and end. Beginning, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And then the last verse, Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. The Lord's steadfast love, the the word behind that English translation, steadfast love, is his special love for his covenant people what George Whitfield delighted to call God's distinguishing love. His love, his special love for his people. Christ's love for his bride, his church. And the psalm recounts various incidents in which the Lord acted out of love. And verses 23 to 32 tells of one such incident involving danger at sea. And I think maybe I'll just read those verses, verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heavens. They went down to the depths. That's the swell of the sea. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. I've often wondered if this might possibly refer to Jonah chapter 1. The sailors there who were converted, doubly saved by the Lord's distinguishing love, saved from the sea, saved to be the Lord's people now. But this passage also well describes beforehand the experience of Jesus' disciples in John chapter 6. Especially, I think, verse 30, the second half of verse 30. And he, that's the Lord, brought them to their desired haven. Do you remember how 
in our passage, it says about as soon as Jesus got into their boat, having walked on the sea, it says immediately they reached the place to which they were going. The second passage is Habakkuk chapter 3. I'll maybe leave that for you to read um, to read this afternoon. It's a poem. That's the second passage, as it were, the Old Testament background to, to the walking on the sea of, of uh, Jesus. Um, it's a poem. Habakkuk 3 is a poem about the Lord coming down from a mountain and going forth in awesome power to save his disciples, trampling the sea, it says. It brilliantly describes what we see in John chapter 6. Uh, it probably is referring to the Exodus and the parting of the Red Sea. But the point is the great zeal the Lord has and Jesus has to guard and save and protect and keep and rescue and bless his people whom he loves. He strides forth, even in anger it says in Habakkuk 3, he strides forth in his fury to rescue his beloved. He tramples the waves of the sea to do that. This isn't just poetic imagery echoed in a micro-incident in John chapter 6. This is the macro story of the gospel. Jesus is God, come down from on high, going forth to save his people. Going forth in awesome boldness to trample the head of Satan for us. And he does that as he goes to the cross, to suffer and die for his church's sake. So can those who belong to Christ lack any good thing, anything they need? No. Let me finally then make some application of this. Some of you, I am sure, I know in fact some of you, are fearful as to what is coming up in the diary in the next few weeks. It may be giving birth if you're watching Eunice. It may be exams for more than one person here. It may be going back to work after extended leave. It may be other things just the daily struggle of your current situation. If you are Christ's, by which I mean, if God has given you a new heart and a new life in Jesus, turning from your sin and trusting Jesus as your saviour, then all his infinite, all Christ's abundant sufficiency is for you. For your blessing, both in eternity and in this life too. Now, not that we're holding to a prosperity gospel here. We're not promised unmitigated health and wealth in this life. But we have the promises of God. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, says the Lord in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. The Lord Jesus will be with you in all his abundant sufficiency and abundant willingness to bless his people. His overflowing kindness, his zeal to bless and provide and help and rescue you. So as you face whatever situation is concerning you, from where will you fetch your help that you need? From where? Where, do you, where does your help come from? Will we not look to the Lord Jesus and his sufficiency? Will, need, will we not trust in him and lean hard on him? And I'm pray, preaching this to myself as well, because I know that when big things come, I, I, I just see the problem. I'm just like Philip. But this is all about not making Philip's mistake all over again and just seeing the issue. But seeing from where are we going to get help for us, for ourselves. And to see the Saviour, Jesus, powerful to save, eager to help and supply and provide. So set Christ before you, the one that you're trusting for eternity. Trust him for the things of this life too. There's a beautiful verse in Isaiah 40 verse 11. It talks about Jesus carrying his lambs in their time of need. And it says this, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his, the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. Those that need carrying, he'll carry. Close to his heart, close to his chest. He'll carry them and he'll gently lead those that are with young. Some here, though, are not yet trusting Christ for eternal things. Well, If that's you, do you not see that Jesus came forth in loving kindness into this world, not primarily to feed a great crowd, not primarily to do that, not primarily to to give the things of this life, but to give eternal life to a world desperately lost under God's judgment, lost in our sin. Did Jesus step forth from the glory of heaven 
to give his life on the cross, to provide such an abundant salvation if you and I didn't really need it. So if you've never turned to Christ, then turn to him. Turn to him at the very least to ask him graciously to show you your need of him. Search through the pages of the Bible, praying that God would show you both Christ and your need of him so that you come and truly believe in him and receive eternal life through him. We each need Jesus Christ. We each need to trust in Jesus Christ. This passage is set before us so that we trust in Jesus Christ. Those who've never trusted in Christ for eternal life, to do so. Those who have trusted in eternal life, uh, in Christ for eternal life, to trust him also for the things of this life too. Well, let's pray together because we need God's grace to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us then. Help us to trust in Jesus, whom you've sent into this world. You've set forth in human flesh before our eyes in the pages of the scriptures so that we trust in him. Heavenly Father, if there's anyone here who's not trusted in Christ to save them from their guilt and sin in your sight, may they do so. Bless them abundantly. Lead them to trust in Jesus, his death on the cross, his redeeming, saving work. And Heavenly Father, for those who have done so, and we quickly forget from where our help comes, help us. Help us to remember at those crucial, stressful, difficult times when we just see the problem, we just see the issue and it feels so big and impossible. Help us to remember that Jesus is abundantly willing and able to supply the needs of his dearly loved bride. Help us then, we pray in his name. Amen.